But I think the more you start to understand that, like, there's those ups and downs. Mm-hmm. Um, the sun can only shine on one side of the mountain. Yeah. So I just cross the mountain, go over the mountain, you know? They got to get through it. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> but, um, like, things have to fall apart before they can fall together. Kind of, this is one of the things he said. I was like, yeah. okay. It's a lot easier just to diverse. And then, like, whatever you see that's sticking, it's like you're throwing spaghetti in the wall, whichever noodle sticks, that's the one you're going to eat. So, and then I started looking at the same way in businesses. It's like, that's why people diverse. It's like way easier to make like 10 grand here, 10 grand here, 10 grand here than making like 100 grand in one place, for example. Like, this is my idea. He's like, what do you think? He's like, <laughs> he's like that's brilliant. I'll quit all my jobs and give you a year of my time. Uh, I called my other friend. I was like, I was like, I have this idea. What do you think? He's like, I could raise you $100,000 next week if you need to start this idea. <laughs> got some loyal friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, again, the power of networking, right? Yeah. So, I more just want to be able to work purely on things that I actually want to work on. And uh, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> That's a crazy journey, man. Like, yeah, it's a long journey. It's a- Welcome back to Two Fries Podcast, <laughs> aka the number one podcast in Winnipeg, where you document the rise of stardom in Winnipeg's talent and personalities. I've been asking y'all to subscribe, but you don't do it, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's get on with the episode. <laughs> Let's bring on our guest. I'll for subscribe. T- yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Let's bring on our guest for today. He's innovating the underwear industry. Please welcome the owner of Unity Underwear, Nick Maharaj. Let's go. Ooh. Welcome. Early morning studio crowd. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Man, I feel like like one of those old TV series where I'm like, welcome Maharaj. <laughs> I, I could have made an entry. Yeah, you know right? <laughs> we filmed that. We filmed that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll come out and only make underwear. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> hey good promo good yeah, promo yeah wwe well, style yeah that's yeah. awesome well thank you for coming on the show i know it's a little early but no problem thanks. my pleasure thanks for having me yeah so we know a little bit about you we're doing research yesterday but okay. let us know what you're about and uh, <laughs> what you, who you are uh that's hard to sum up really quickly mm-hmm. how, how much of a how much of a journey story do you want as long as give you us all go, like, give us everything you got all right so we'll go back to 2000 and 13. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, solid year. Solid year. Yeah. So 2013, um, well, the year before I had just dropped out of school, mm-hmm. didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, ended up getting a job selling insurance. Um, it just turned out my dad was a financial advisor at the same time. So while I was doing that, he's like, why don't you just come work for me? Yeah. So I started working with my dad a little bit, but then I was like, okay, I'm like 21 years old um, and selling my friends on life insurance, investments, blah, blah, blah. It's not really the easiest thing. Nobody really wants to talk about dying when they're 21. (laughs) So um, I was like, okay, I'm just going to pursue something that, like, interests me in the meantime because might as well I always have this to fall back on. It was like, what's the worst case scenario, right? Mm -hmm. So I liked music. I started producing music, started DJing. um, And then the only way to start DJing in a club, because I didn't really know anybody that worked there, was to get a job at the club. So I became a busser at Stereo. Uh, from there, I ended up moving up to a bar back, uh, bartender, VIP host, eventually assistant manager. Um, and I was kind of sitting there as a assistant manager. I was making like 14 bucks an hour working. There were some hour, weeks I worked like 95 hour weeks. Wow. Um, but then <laughs> Canadians, <laughs> shout out Canadians, would be like, uh, you shouldn't have to work that much <laughs> yeah. to make this club we're on. So we're going to just pay you 50 hours. I was like, okay, there goes 45 hours of work. Yeah. Um, and then we'd sit there and we'd see promoters that are getting paid like five bucks a head. So they're making like, I don't know, a couple grand a week or whatever. Yeah. And my guest list as assistant manager was three to 500 people a week. Wow. So yeah. uh, just because, you know, and texting people running like tw- 12 Facebook accounts and stuff, mm-hmm. running Facebook ads. So I was like, okay, I was like, I should probably give this a shot. So I talked to uh, John Skeen, DJ Hollywood Hype at the time, now Skeen Music. And he introduced me to Steven uh, Hua. Uh, so that would have been 2014 essentially told him like, Hey, like, and I was, had already tried a couple events of my own at stereo. Like, uh, I had made a deal with them. Like, I'm not making enough money. Can I start like a Wednesday night thing? So I saw that and I t- ended up meeting Steven through that because he saw whatever effort I was putting into it. And so I ended up meeting with Steven and, uh, so he's like, Hey, I'll get you, I can get you started on this night and this night. Let's see what you can do kind of thing. And I had like a really like, um, I don't really have a promoter mindset. Yeah. So Steven has a very different mindset than me. I was more of a operational mindset at the time because I kind of came, you know, I made my way up and um, Canadians would always send me like the nightclub and bar convention. So I ended up like meeting like John Taffer, for example, from Bar Rescue and like 
<laughs> had like long talks to them. I was like, this is my problems. How do I solve it? Like, then he just starts screaming in my face and spitting and, and <laughs> telling me what to do or whatever. So I was like, I was like, I had like a really like that kind of mindset. So I ended up like, I think the first place I worked at was Boa. So I was running, running ordinary Fridays with who are there. And the first time I walked in, I was like, yo, this place is a mess. I was like, you're losing, you're getting about $1,800 stolen a night from your bartenders, yeah. your VIP hosts, or not VIP hosts, one of the security guards. I was like, they're stealing about four or $500 a night. I ended up writing a 2,500 word essay, send it to Steven and he forwarded it to the owner. And the owner was like, what's going on here? Am I getting audited? <laughs> but <it was> so <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, so Steve was like, okay, this guy has a little bit of value. Um, and it, so I ended up working at the like, green room with him, um, and ended up working pretty much every single event concert stuff for them for about six years. But, uh, 2015, 2015 or 2016, 2015, um, I was like, okay, I was like, I've been promoting for a little bit. I was like, I saved up some money whatever. I was like, I think the next step is to own a club. So I messaged Jack, uh, who's like the biggest club owner the probably the biggest club one that he's seen. And I was, so I messaged Jack and I was like, okay, I was like, I know you just opened four for one. This is like a month or two after four for one opened. I was like, I, was like, I know you just opened four for one, but it was like the next project you're on, I want in, like I'm ready to buy a club. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, he's like, I probably won't do a club for a long time if I do another one after this. He's like, why don't you just buy some of my shares so we can be partners at four for one. Uh, okay. So I ended up buying it at four for one. That was awesome. Was there, for, well, obviously we were open for four and a half years um, until COVID shut us down. Um, then, but a year before COVID ended, I was like, well, there was a couple other things I did. I ended up having, uh, Jack had a restaurant called Blind Tiger. The front of it was a coffee shop. It was like a speakeasy style. So a restaurant in the back, coffee shop in the front. Mm-hmm. And I had told him, I was like, I wanted to open a coffee shop. He's like, well, I don't want to run my coffee shop. He's like, why don't you just take over my coffee shop? <laughs> I ended up doing that. Um, that ended up falling through, but, uh, and then there was a, my, my old friend Shay, who had Shay's cafe, uh, Shay's court and whatever. Um, I would, he was always running restaurants. I was in the clubs and then we w- ended up buying Teo's, which became Shay's court. And then I was running the bar side. He was running the restaurant side. I ended up having a falling out and I, I sold my shares there. Um, you know, halfway through COVID kind of thing. There's some COVID disagreements there, but, um, yeah. So fast forward, um, actually not fast forward, step back a little bit. 2017, I was like, I think it was like right around when Harambe died. Harambe got shot, like oh, poor gorilla. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I was like, I want to get underwear with Harambe on it. Yeah. I think that'd be hilarious. It was like a, there was like a running joke at, between the four foreign security guys and stuff too. It was like, we had code Harambe if anything went wrong and stuff. So I was like, I want to get Harambe underwear. That'd be hilarious. I could buy it for the security guards, whatever. Um, couldn't find underwear with Harambe on it. I was like, and then, and then I was like, what if I got underwear with like eggplants on it? I was like, okay, <laughs> could it get that either? So I started contacting. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to make some myself. Screw it. Yeah. Started contacting a bunch of manufacturers. So I was like, yeah, I want to make this underwear. And it ended up like majority of them were like, yeah, we could do that. But like, if you have custom print, like you need to buy like 20,000 pairs or something like that. Mm-hmm. So whatever. I was like, I was like, okay, let me look into this. So they started sending me like different samples. Like, they're like, what kind of fabric do you want to use? I was like, I have no idea. I'm not a fashion designer. <laughs> so they sent me like, a hundred different fabrics and I'm looking at them and I found the fabric that I use. It's like a 95% bamboo fabric composite with uh, spandex. And uh, I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, this is, I'm like, can you send me like a sample of a pair just using this fabric? So they send me a sample of the pair of this fabric. And then uh, the way they sent them, like the fit was just terrible. It's, I, I don't know. My manufacturer is in uh, China. So like, obviously I guess people there are shaped differently than me. So the fit wasn't very right. Um, so I ended up contacting like 20 different manufacturers, getting different samples of whoever would make would using this uh, composite fabric. Yeah. Ended up buying a decent one, but it still the fit wasn't good. Um, and then so I t- spent like two years getting the fit properly because I'm not a fashion designer. So I was like editing, and sending back, get the changes. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, okay. And then it takes like a month to get here. And then, you know, delay, delay, delay. And like all the stuff that goes starting a company. So by 2019, I finally had a product, November 2019, and we released it. And uh, yeah, and 2020 released the colors, and last year, 2021, exactly two years later, released the women's line. Okay. And uh, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> That's a crazy journey, man. Like, yeah, it's a long journey. It's a, I think the lesson that I have to show people there is that uh, you never really know where you'll end up, right. and you don't really know what careers exist unless you just start trying things. Mm-hmm. Like I went into a club to DJ and it turned out I like the operational side better than the DJing side. 
And then on top of that, my brother had started music, making music, and he's like a really talented, semi successful producer. And like after like, uh, so I was probably making music for like a year or two, and then he started making it for like two months. I was like, okay, this guy's already better than me. I was like, I'm just gonna like, I gotta stick to promoting and let him. <laughs> then I could promote him, but a better promoter I am, I could promote him and his music. And yeah. so yeah, and then that made me move on and move on. And so like, I kept like transitioning, and even from then after Unity, like Unity is not even my focus now. Um, it's just Unity is almost more of like my tool to experiment. I guess is the best way. Like it was my first like e-commerce business, so. I uh, learned, I mean, I had somebody that made a website, but then my cousin had taken it over, who's like a web developer, coder kind of thing. And then eventually he was just too busy. So I learned how to do the website myself. And then I had to learn how to like take pictures. I ended up getting like a photo studio in my basement before. And like, so I, there was like a bunch of different steps and like marketing. Like I was used to get paid to, uh, as a digital marketer, I do social media for people. I was running their ads, taking pictures, whatever, for a bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was good at it. And then it turned out uh, doing it for like nightlife, restaurants, so on is very different than yeah. doing it for e-commerce. So there's a huge learning curve there. It's like, okay, the way that you do ads, ads and the copywriting and everything is just completely different. So mm -hmm. it's almost like an experiment for me now. It's like anytime I'm like, I, I'm using it as like a learning tool for whatever I put into my future businesses, mm -hmm. which there's a lot of future businesses coming. So Solid. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you've done so many things. Yeah. Have you, is there any like through line throughout all those businesses that you take from or that you notice um, that, hey, this is somewhat similar in this and this can be applied everywhere? I mean, the certain like, the certain things you have to learn that I think goes across each business, sales skills, mm -hmm. uh, copywriting skills, like if you can learn to write better um, and marketing skills. Absolutely. But I think at the end of the day, I guess it's not really a skill, but networking is definitely this, the most important thing by far. Okay. Like, by far yeah. <laughs> like because you you can learn skills or you can read about them but if you ask somebody who's already done it like the more people you have in your network you don't have to be afraid to ask for help so i didn't want to open a club by myself i was like i could have been like all cocky like okay i'm pretty good at promoting i'm not the best promoter but i'm pretty good at promoting i kind of know how to run a bar for the most part and everything in it i was like but i'm not gonna pretend i know how to like own a bar that's a way bigger thing so I, I ended up contacting the guy that, that I already knew because I had DJed at Opera and promoted it a little bit. And then maybe I hadn't promoted Opera yet, but I did, for sure I DJed. Uh, and I contacted Jack because Jack was the guy that I knew was the best at it. So I was like, and then I was able to be successful at four for one with it because I was able to reach out to somebody who was already successful. At it. Mm -hmm. So like the networking aspects, like just you don't have to be afraid to ask for help. And then it, it helps you move it forward. Mm -hmm. But then you continue to grow your network and then you find out about new businesses and you can continue exploring and like, so on, so on, so on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, it's not like what you know is about who you know. And that yeah. changes like I'm, every industry. It almost is like, why well, have like one brain when you can have a thousand. Exactly. Kind of thing. So, <laughs> I mean, you tried every single business, like from oh, not promoting. Yet. Not I'm, yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to enter in a few more. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I want to see like why, like what was the reason that you just didn't stick to one business itself? Um. So I had a few different reasons. So one of the things that I realized in promoting, um, because like w I was promoting so many different nights with Steven. So I think at one point we were actually, there was one summer, I think we were promoting eight nights a week because wow. we had two nights. <laughs> it was something like that. Yeah, we were, it was, I remember this Steven talking. was like, I think we're going to be doing like 10 nights a week this summer. I don't remember what it was. I think it might've been a summer or like, um, there was this one point where there was like just so much going on. And I was like, I was like, okay, I was like, even if most of these don't succeed, it's like, let's say I don't make $1,000 per night, but I'm making $300 per night. There's so many nights that it's, it's so much easier to make a few hundred bucks here, a few hundred bucks there. So I was like, yeah. and then I started looking at the same way in businesses. I was like, that's why people diverse. It's like way easier to make like 10 grand here, 10 grand here, 10 grand here than making like a hundred grand in one place, for example. Like, mm -hmm. unless it's like, it depends on the business, obviously, because if you fully dedicate yourself to a business, but for the lower level it's like it's a lot easier just to diverse and then like whatever you see that's sticking it's like you're just throwing spaghetti in the wall and whichever noodle sticks that's the one you're gonna eat mm -hmm. right. so, <laughs> so then uh, like it sounds like i'm doing so many things but i didn't mention like the 30 plus businesses i tried that yeah. my friends don't even know that i started that it failed so, it's like, so, so you're like the definition of an entrepreneur right like you know you know I, I guess so like I, I don't like saying it but yeah, sure, you know, <laughs> yeah. of course i guess so yeah but so you just start all these things. And one thing I have a question about is if you do so many things, how do you 
resource your time? Like, how do you value your time? Like this much time. Pri- priorities, like this. knowing what to, and then uh, priorities and then uh, partners for me was a big thing. Cause um, like, obviously I did not do even the majority of things at four for one. I was somewhat minor. Like I was promoting, I was VIP hosting and I'd attend meetings and do a little bit of somewhat marketing strategy with Jack. But for the most part, I was like, there's different people for each aspect. Right. So like, I'm not spending like 40 hours, I usually wasn't spending 40 hours a week on things for four for one. Sure. So um, I'm able to just prioritize, okay, this is making me the most money, but it requires this much time. Okay, this is making me the second most money, it requires this much time. And I have this much time to learn, this much time to network, this much time to go out, so on, so on. Obviously that varies. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the going out part may take too much time and then you have to rebalance yourself oh, yeah. again. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just time management, yeah. uh, which it's not the easiest, but you, you get it eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, entrepreneuring is not easy at all right like i mean you dropped out of university in like 2012 i believe right yeah it was 2012 i, right. did, I did like three semesters yeah but it was like a yeah there's a gap between there so yeah it was like three semesters and that's not an easy choice to make man <laughs> no. and like you're in university you drop out like especially not with a brown dad <laughs> <laughs> yeah what was that like yeah. what was that what'd they say uh he well because he you know he's trying to figure out like because I was him, like, okay, like, I originally went to university for uh, astrophysics. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but the, I specifically wanted to work like an observatory, and the job was, uh, like, you had to go to, like, U Victoria, I think it was. Yeah. And I had, like, a terrible biology chemistry teacher in univer- or high school. He just, like, hated me, mm-hmm. like, absolutely hated me. So I just didn't take the class. I was like, I'm just going to avoid this guy. Uh, so obviously if I was going to go into astrophysics, I now have to t- go take a bunch of courses, high school courses to be able to get into it. And then on top of that, like my, like my scores just weren't good enough to get into that university kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, I was like this. And then only three people a year actually get hired and they're all coming out of the university. So I was like, okay, this is like hopeless. So I ended up like switching to like, I was like, what else do I like? Okay, I like working out. I like Muay Thai, basketball, whatever. I was like, let me try kinesiology, whatever. So I gave it a sh- that a shot too, and then I was like, I was like, oh, this is just you know, I'm just not interested. I was like skipping class to try to join the Korean Association to eat their candies because they're so delicious, <laughs> and like sitting there watching like car shows on TV in in UC yeah. with my buddies and whatever, trying to pick up girls and stuff. <laughs> so and then, and then my dad's like, "Hey, okay. I was like, why don't you try this? Why don't you try this?" I'm like, "I don't know. None of it's just sticking." I was like, "I think I just need to like you know, give something else a shot." Yeah. So I just kind of like, he wasn't very happy about it. But once he started to see somewhat success in other, he's like, okay, it's like, um, you know, at stereo, I was like, okay, he's like, well, you're just barting in like twice a week, once a week. Yeah. I was like, okay. And then I was like, and then I got promoted, promoted, promoted. And he's like, okay, he's like, I see something there. And I was like, okay. and then I was like, you know, these guys are making this much money doing this. And then once he started seeing the money coming in, yeah. um, and I did involve him in a couple of investments. He's really, he's always really open about like investments. He's like, if you see a good idea, like, let me know. He's like, I want to invest kind of thing. So but it's it's funny investing with him because like, so I uh, one in, one of the investments and I'm not ashamed about it. People are like, "Well, you borrowed money from your dad," and I'm like, "Whatever." Like, yeah. If I if I, if I if I like he's so this is why I say whatever because better than okay. uh, for example, 2015 Summer Sound. I invested in Summer Sound. It wasn't entirely made my money, but my dad paid for some of it, mm-hmm. and I essentially had pitched him the investment. Is like this is it. Uh, I was like, you could invest or I'll go borrow money from the bank because mm-hmm. like, you know, I could get a line of credit. It'll be like 5% interest. And uh, I think it can make like 20, 25% interest or t- profit, whatever. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'll do it for, I'll do it. You can keep the money in the family, but I'm going to take 10% interest regardless. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, so I end up like investing with him and then he, he you know, he'll take like interest. Yeah. Um. So it's almost like taking a bank loan and then he gets the interest to keep the money in the family, which is what I mean is eventually going to come to me and my brothers and sister anyways. So, um, that's the way I look at it. So yeah. it's never just like a, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not taking his wealth and like putting it to something no. unuseful, right? And it, I mean, if I don't have to, I won't either, but like, it depends on the investment. So like, I think he'll be like interested in like, you know, then he's kind of, yeah, it's yeah. open about it. So, so like you tried everything. Was there a moment where you're like, man, like maybe I should have Stuck to university, became an astrophysicist. I think like once a week. Yeah, <laughs> oh, wow. yeah, because there's always like, I mean, it's it's hard not to ride the up and downs. Because I mean, it's like anything. that's a good day and a bad day. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're doing. But then like when the bad days, you're like, oh, maybe you, should, you know, maybe I should try to do something that's safer. What if I was just doing this? Especially like my two older brothers have like steady, safe careers. Like my right. one brother's a mechanical engineer, and the other one's like doing like corporate investments or something like that. So, um. And then I see my income going up and down. I'm like, oh, I made so much money last week, so much money last month or whatever. And then the next month, I'm like, oh. 
<laughs> like <laughs> I lost so much. Money. Yeah. So it it. <laughs> so uh, yeah. So yeah. It's um. I do a lot of like other things on the side to keep myself more leveled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Like a lot of meditating and stuff. My morning routine is way too extensive and <laughs> half day routines and stuff. Like I have like a lot of things just to like kind of keep my head leveled throughout the whole thing. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, was it like, was there ever a moment where you thought, hey, maybe this is not for me in any of your businesses? Uh, in all of them. In all of them? Yeah, all of them multiple times. Okay. Um, how, but do you, how do you get over that and how do you push yourself to keep going? It's, it's funny. So uh, the way I got over it changed uh, depending on the business and depending on the time of my life. Okay. Uh, probably in the club days, the way to get over it was to go party. <laughs> I bet today's a bad day. I'm going to call up some friends and have fun. Yeah. You know, like I'm not going to you know, forget about these things. I'm going to go back. I'm going to invite some friends. We're going to get drinks, whatever. Mm-hmm. Get really drunk. Um, and then it changed um, talking to people that like have been through it. Yeah. Um, or let's like listening to inspiring things. More so now, the best way that like when something's going bad and I feel like giving up, like I'll listen to like inspiring things. Uh I read more biographies than anything. So obviously when you like hear like the <laughs> kind of like how close like different billionaires are close to going to bankrupt and they just like, you know, they gave it that another push to keep going. And then you're like, okay, you're like, I'm a but I'll continue. <laughs> like uh, there's no other choice. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how I get through it. Um, but I think the more you start to understand that like there's those ups and downs, mm-hmm. um, the sun can only shine on one side of the mountain. So I just cross the mountain to go over the mountain, you know, they got to like get through it. it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's unique, man. Yeah. Or there's one thing that my brother told me, I'll, actually a lot of the time if I had a bad day, I'll just talk to my brother. Cause he's like a little too wise for his own good. But, um, he's like, things have to fall apart before they can fall together. Kind of, this is one of the things he said. I was yeah. like, okay. Wisdom, <laughs> wisdom. <Yeah. laughs> so that, you know, sometimes things are falling apart and you just got to like realize that that's just like how it goes. <laughs> it's a part of life. You got to put it, it back together and, Build but, a higher mountain. But then you always like kind of realize that, like things do fall back together. They like do. you're like, oh, this happened. I thought it was the end of the world. But then like because of that, I ended up finding this. And that's right. ended up how I ended up like pivoting to new things, mm-hmm. which is why I'm ending up in the new businesses that I'm starting now is like mm-hmm. that are way bigger than what I'm doing right now. And I'm like, oh, it's like if I didn't go through, like I just moved back from Vancouver, for example. I only lived there for like seven months. Mm-hmm. And I originally moved out there because I wanted to open a bar there. And I was like, because bars closed here, right. but the demographic here at the bars, you know, it's a young demographic. They're not spending much money, um, limited to what you can do and so on, so on. I was like, you know what? I was like, maybe if I go to a new city, um, I'll be, I'll be re-inspired. I'll be re-motivated. And Vancouver has way more money. So it's probably all the demographic going out. And I ended up going a couple of times last summer. I was like, you know, maybe this could work. I'll move out here, give it a shot. And then mm-hmm. I was bartending there to get, do some market research, and I was like, "This is not going to work here. This is like <laughs> this is a weird crowd in <laughs> <laughs> Vancouver." So, um, and then I was like, "Oh, I was like, okay, now I need to completely re-strategize." And then I ended up like putting more time into Unity, and then talking to a couple of friends, and I had way more time, so I was reading like hundred pages a day and listening to podcasts and stuff, and just like networking a little bit. And then I kind of stumbled across a couple of new ideas, which I'm working on now. And I'm like, if I wanted to done that, if things wanted to fall apart. So it's you, nice. Yeah. You, you keep talking about these new ideas. Are you able I, to share? What, I can't what share one of them because sure. it's an innovative idea. And I just, I'll share a little bit about sure. it, but not in any detail. No. I came up with an idea like four days ago <laughs> and I was like, this is it. It's fresh. It's so fresh. I called, I called one friend who's like my go-to CTO. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I have this idea. What do you think? He's like, I think it's brilliant. Let's do it. I called my other friend who's like kind of in uh, manufacturing distributing because it has that aspect to it too. And I was like, this is my idea. He's like, what do you think? He's like, <laughs> he's like, that's brilliant. I'll quit all my jobs and give you a year of my time. Uh, I called my other friend. I was like, I was like, I have this idea. What do you think? He's like, I could raise you a hundred thousand dollars next week. If you need to start this idea. <laughs> you got some loyal friends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's again, the power of networking, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I called those three people, four people. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so I was like, okay. So, and I was like, I need to give this a, give this a bit more of a shot. So, uh, or give it an actual shot. So that's going to be what I'm dedicating most of my time to. And then I have another idea that I'm going to start with my friend. And it's kind of just based. So <laughs> I was like, because it's, it's just more like a passion project. So I, I've been actually wanted to start a podcast on my own for a while. So it's going to, the first step to it is a podcast. Sure. But it's more revolved around uh, hookahs. Mm, okay. So I love smoking hookah. Uh, between me and my friend, we've been smoking for 30 years. 
uh, the friend that I'm doing it with. So we were like, but that's just like the first aspect. He was originally going to write a book about hookah, it's like the etiquette of it and like the culture of it and everything right. through. Sure. Um, and I was like, why don't we take this in a different level? I was like, I love it too. I was like, I need something like to, that I could put like, that I really like working on, for example. So we're going to start with the podcast. It's going to, I kind of want to open like a hookah lounge and it's probably going to go into like a, a, a bunch of different ways. So I, I don't want to say too much about it, but sure. this is going to be a lot of things related to hookah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's that, that, that business I'm going to start as well. Okay. Yeah. So wh- when you have these ideas, like what's your first step? Like where, yeah. where do you come up with these ideas? Are I write a lot. Are you in the shower thinking of things? Or like, um, <laughs> or usually in, driving, driving, yeah. okay. driving, showering, but I meditate a lot too. Okay. Uh, like a lot. <laughs> like how much is a lot? Um, a lot less now than in 2020. I'd say 2020 was like two to three hours a day. Wow. Okay. Um, depend. Cause I, there's a lot of different meditation. I had like five different meditations I'd be doing a day. Mm-hmm. Um, now I just do probably 15 minutes ish, maybe sometimes up to an hour. It depends on the day. It depends on what kind of meditations I'm doing and stuff. Um, so sometimes ideas come to my head when I'm doing that or if I'm listening to like podcasts, showering, but usually in the car when I'm driving, like I drove back from Vancouver. So I was mm-hmm. sitting in the car for, <laughs> you know, 20 hours. Yeah. So I had some time to think and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, I just talking to friends too. Like the, right. the friends that I usually hang out with are just like, we're just constantly shooting ideas off right. of each other. Um, and a lot of them are dumb. <laughs> um, but like, and then I also do the kind of thing where like write down an idea a day, but I write a lot in general too. Like mm-hmm. if I have like a, my, my girlfriend kind of realizes too, is like, like, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm going to write it down. And then I send her like a 10 page thing that I wrote down, trying to like <laughs> explain what I'm trying to talk about kind of thing. I was like, does this make sense? Nice. she's like you're a good writer I'm like I don't think I am but I'm glad you understand what I'm saying yeah. <laughs> you know so um yeah a lot of writing okay yeah I mean you have to like the best way to just write and get your ideas out is simply just write it right like well, it's also like another way of remembering too right because right. I have horrible memory yeah uh, like terrible terrible memory and my attention span like I, I definitely I haven't been you know diagnosed with ADD but like my entire family pretty much like really bad my dad's the same way it's like um, it's funny because I was reading uh, one of the Elon Musk documentaries and they said that his head is like, like he'll, somebody will talk to him and then like one word will like trigger like an entire train of thought. And then you can just realize that like, he's not paying attention to you anymore. Cause he said the word rocket. And then I don't know where he designed a company to say, <laughs> uh, I don't want to say I'm the same as Elon Musk, but I have the same uh, kind of thing where if I talk to somebody, they say a word, it triggers a train of thought. I completely forget everything I said. So. If it's the same thing, if I'm thinking of an idea, if I start thinking of something else in my head or some something that came on the song, I'll completely forget the idea. Mm-hmm. So I'll yeah. always, I always keep like a, a write down like an idea a day kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's like 10 ideas in a day. But a lot of them are going to be complete trash and they're just hilarious. And I'll just like tell my friend, keep up with this idea. It's stupid. And he's like, yeah, it's stupid. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay cool. Yeah, it's stupid. <laughs> Check that off. <laughs> That's the same thing. Like, yeah, we do. I remember this one story and it was like, uh, I'm sitting in bed and... I'm about to fall asleep, and then the idea pops in my mind. I'm like, "Yo, I got, I gotta wake up, gotta write this down." And it was, do you a, keep a dream dream journal? Mm-hmm. You got, no, you, you, you got to do that. I'm gonna be honest. I have for one week. I did it for one week. It's hard I, to maintain, but if you do it, it's like game changer. Because the more you keep it, the more you remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, you from your dreams, and oftentimes the dreams are like extremely educational. Mm-hmm. Whether it's like you're coming up ide- with ideas in your dream, or you're like realizing things about yourself mm-hmm. to help like improve you as a person. Um, I haven't been doing it lately, but mainly because like my morning routine is so like extensive already. I don't want to add another <laughs> step to it. Yeah. Um, but when I was doing it, uh, for a while, I was also practicing like astral projecting and stuff like that, which is a whole different yeah, story. Yeah. But, um, my sleep, I was like, well, I was really trying to focus on like trying to make my sleep productive. Cause I was like, there's not enough hours in a day. Yep, yep. How can I learn from my sleep? And I was like, yeah. try to, <laughs> I'll try to write down stuff though. Yeah, that was a, that was a lot. But when it, when you start writing down your dreams, you'll you'll learn a lot from them. Were you able to lucid dream? Yeah, I'm able to do like yeah, I was able to astral project. Like I have some crazy stories about like Doctor Strange over here. Um, yeah, no, I I would leave my body. I would walk around my house and find things under my couch that I forgot were there. Um, oh. <laughs> there was uh, my girlfriend at the time was coming home from work at like six in the morning, and I was out, I was outside the house, and I saw the car coming down the street, and then like I followed the car home. And then, I, and then right when she came into the garage, I went back into my body and I woke up and then I walked to the garage. I was like, oh, she's here. I was like, <laughs> so yeah, it's a warm, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, um, how, you, how? Yeah. uh, there's like a stage in your sleep where, um, picturing yourself leaving your body kind of thing. Okay. Um, 
so at first when you first do it, you kind of like, it's almost like you pop out of your body and you're sitting there and you're just like, uh, but it's obviously not like crystal clear. But then, so when I first did it, I would like do that and I'd look around my room and then I realized, I was like, I was like, oh, this is there. This is there. Oh, I forgot this is in there. And I'd be like looking around my room and then, you know, like something would wake me up and then go back to my body and it would keep expanding, expanding, expanding. And eventually I'd be like going to the living room. I'd be like, oh, I was like, I was like, why is my dog on that couch? I'm like, okay. And then like, I look under the couch. I was like, oh, there's like a toonie there. What's that? Oh, there's like eight hookah tips in there. Like I should probably clean that up. And then, start a business out of there. <laughs> well, they, they keep expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, yeah, it's really interesting when you, once you do it, but yeah that's really well, interesting so like <laughs> you can look into it too that's funny because like uh probably like eight months after i did it the cia you like released one of like those papers where they like talk about experiments they're doing and it's like in the cold war there was they'd have people that would actually like astral project and they're able to like locate like nuclear i think it was nuclear um styles and stuff that russia had hitting like the indian ocean and stuff and like yeah. it's pinpoint there and because i like how good the guys were at like leaving their bodies mm -hmm. stuff so it's like i was like oh maybe i'm not just like psycho imagining things I think it's more just like you're accessing your subconscious and you're remembering things that were there that like you weren't actually remembering. So it's like, oh yeah, I dropped a loony under there and oh, that's where okay. it is. And like, that's more what I think it is. I don't think it's really like separating, you know, maybe it is, but from, from some of the experiences I had, it might be, but like for the most part, it's like, yeah, I'm probably just like remembering things that like mm -hmm. I wasn't having access to before kind of thing. Are you, are you a spiritual person? Um, uh, so person? 2020 was my year of spiritual growth. That was my goal. Okay. Um, I was, like, if you asked me in 2020, I'd say yes. Now I'd say not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, more so because like, I usually always pick an area of growth each year, and that was my year of spiritual growth. So I was like, I dove into it. That's why I was, that's why I ended up starting astral projecting. That's why I started meditating a bunch and doing a bunch of other different things. So, <laughs> so, so when you're saying you leave your body, yeah. is it like, are, are you more of just like recalling, like just past information that's or is that's it like that's physically? that's more what i think it is okay i think it's like you're accessing your subconscious and you're like rolling casually walking through your past memories almost so it's like oh yeah this is there because it's more like I, I would walk around my room but the thing the weird thing about it is that i would also um maybe you're accessing your consciousness that you don't really realize you have access to so you're sleeping but you can still hear things for example mm. so like i could see things moving in the corner like right. maybe my dog was rolling over or something and i knew that was happening so that wouldn't be happening you know that wasn't accessing my past subconscious i'd be right. acting accessing something current mm -hmm. so so like <laughs> so, i don't know so, how to pinpoint it because the way this like i'm picturing this in my head is like you're sitting there meditating right oh, no, so i'd be laying uh, down okay yeah and the way you do it is like you look up and it's almost like you <laughs> grab a rope out of your chest and you pull yourself up so like, are you physically like, getting up or no, you're just, you're, it's like your soul out of your oh, body. Oh, yeah. it's like hey. Dr. Strange vibes. hundred percent. Yeah. It, and it actually, yeah, it's Dr. Strange. Yeah. I'm Dr. Strange. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah. The movie's coming out. <laughs> I, I'm actually really excited to see that movie. I heard a lot of good things about it. I heard you were in it. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I am. <laughs> that's really interesting. Yeah. Man. Like that's, I mean, it is kind of like, <laughs> No, for no other good words. It's kind of crazy. It is hundred percent crazy. hundred yeah. percent is crazy. Um, it's really hard to tell your friends that you're doing that too. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a couple of friends that were like kind of experimenting in that kind of realm as well. And my girlfriend at the time was as well. Right. So, so um, both of you are Doctor Strange. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but like I had a couple of friends that were doing it too, and like right. or experimenting in that, you know, different different things like that too. So, um, just like like really long forms of meditation where you're like kind of just out of your body too. But yeah. so like there was a lot of different, ex ex we're experimenting in that. So it was good to have a couple of people to bounce it off of. But like, if you, if, if I go tell like my dad or my mom that they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, you're, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they're like, well, but you know, this exper I'm experimenting with it and yeah. I'm learning from it. So why not continue? But um, it was very time, time occupying. And because you're waking yourself up, Typically, at one point I was able to do it just like I would wake up when I would regularly wake up and then I'd go into a form of meditation where I could kind of leave my body like that. Um, but for the most part, you're supposed to wake up halfway through your sleep. And if you screw it up, then your sleep gets screwed up because you're not going to succeed every time, maybe like once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. So like the rest of the time, you have your alarm set for three in the morning to wake up or whatever, four in the morning to wake yourself up. And you go and you're like, oh, it's not working. Oh, I can't fall back asleep. Oh, no. So like it, it could be pretty painful. Um, and especially 2020, I was... I was there was a business I was working on too, which was very time occupying mm -hmm. uh, at all hours of the day. So it was really like exhausting. And then I ended up like slowing down and stopping. I was like, I need to focus on 
the business I was working at the time. So, so did that ever help yeah. the business aspect of your of your life? Like, was it ever like obviously if you're not getting enough sleep indirectly because it was yeah. like it would help your mind, mm-hmm. um, it help like access parts of your mind and it helps you meditate better and uh, you know relax and it's something to focus on. So, by like directly, not really. It's, I wouldn't be like sitting there coming with business ideas. To yeah, me. it was more like it was more like okay, how long can I last this state? Let's see what I just roam around while I still can, kind of thing. Yeah. That's pretty dope. Man. That's, like, that's actually crazy. Yeah, you, yeah. L- l- you should look into it. It's interesting. Yeah, because I, I do re- I really research in sleep, right? And, okay. And so you know, I know I know about the, the stages and different ways and how much we don't know about the yeah. mind and what happens. This is the first time. Sleep, I sleep is really interesting. Yeah, it's uh, crazy. I, I did a master class on sleep, um, which was really interesting. Don't ask me anything about it because I don't remember most of it. But I okay. just re- all I know is that sleep is really important. Yeah. Which that was what actually one of the reasons why I stopped doing that too, because it was interrupting my sleep. Um, especially, especially when you weren't successful. And, um, again, at the time, like I was taking business meetings with people in like Singapore and Dubai and stuff. So I'd be like, Oh, four in the morning, we have to have a conference call. So I can't do this because everything going back and forth. So it's like, yeah, I had to stop. <laughs> well, yeah. Sleep, sleep's important. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Extremely. So let's, let's transition this conversation <laughs> into more of unity now. So, sure. so you started that as just, uh, you wanted harambe underwear yeah it was i want the joke underwear right, then yeah. i realized that there was like um i was like i don't know why there's not regular underwear made out of this fabric let's do that so yeah. i was like i'm gonna release just basic colors so black white gray um so once yeah i got once i got the fit down got that got the you know all the branding down my branding's not that great but once i got the branding down <laughs> um uh yeah we released it yeah so like the biggest question is why underwear man like uh i thought it'd be hilarious yeah um Especially at the time, <laughs> uh, it didn't happen too often. But I did have a, um, I did have a bad habit of ending up in my underwear in the middle of the club uh, at four for one. I really, oh. <laughs> there was definitely a couple nights where I was like, I was I don't know why the I think my security thought it'd just be funny, just be like on stage in my underwear dancing, and then, <laughs> and then the next day like, yeah, you were doing this, and I'm like, because I always wore like onesies. My mom, yeah. ma- my mom makes like a lot of my clothes, uh, so I had to like design me these like onesies. Okay. And so I have like a leopard print onesie, for example, and then like I'd be dancing on stage and I would button it because it was like getting hot, and then I don't know, I'm just like in my underwear dancing. <laughs> so, I don't know. So that led to your business <laughs> idea. Like, well, it was one of the things like maybe I should have cool underwear. I was like, what if I was like, what if one day I you know accidentally got in my underwear, but then my yeah. staff saw me was wearing Harambe underwear? That'd be sick. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah. so for the average consumer out there, like. I would just go to Costco, buy like a six pack, right, of underwear. It's so like, how do you distinguish yourself from the market? Uh, so, I mean, our niche is that while well, we're eco friendly, because ninety five percent bamboo fabric, right, uh, and it's a lot of bamboo fabric isn't made in eco friendly way. Ours is; it's like mechanical. Uh, the chemicals are like OECA Tech certified and all this mm-hmm. stuff. So, it's uh, it's eco friendly, which is the biggest difference. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other eco friendly brands. And I didn't want to compete with them. My goal is to make myself look like one of the regular premium brands, like Calvin Klein, for example, right. um, so that we could be in like a big box store. Mm-hmm. And so then, in, let's say, let's say you, I'll use an example because I walked into the bay and I was like, "Hey, let's see what these underwear brands look like." And then they had like Joe Boxer, Calvin Klein, uh, Jockey, and uh, I think it was like Ralph Lauren or something. And I was like, "Okay," I was like, "Okay, none of these brands are eco-friendly. Mm-hmm. They're all still using uh, cotton." Uh, and they're all using plastic packaging. Mm. I was like, I was like, if I could present myself in like a premium way like this, but be eco friendly and be priced even slightly less, then let's say you're walking into a store and you say, okay, I have Calvin Klein this, 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 and then you can feel the underwear because my my packaging is so you can feel the underwear through the thing, whereas all of them have like just closed plastic. Okay, so first you see packaging's not plastic, then you touch it, like Holy shit, this is really soft because it's way softer than anything and it lasts. On average, like I have Unity that I've been wearing f- since the beginning, my test subject underwear. So I'm still wearing mm-hmm. uh, five years. And then I've had a Calvin Klein's ones that lasted four months. Mm. So, I mean, but on average, I'd say they last maybe eight times longer than competitors. So, okay, so they're really durable as well. So you're looking at, let's say you're going to the store, you see the Calvin Klein for 30, you see mine for 25. But mine's also eco-friendly and it's really soft and it's not using plastic bag gel. So that's the kind of way I'm trying to position myself. It's like an alternative to premium brands that just so happens to also be eco-friendly. Mm-hmm. Whereas a lot of the other eco-friendly brands are like, we're eco-friendly. You, that's why you should buy us. And I was like, I don't want to do that because a lot of people are just like associate eco-friendly with maybe not so comfortable, maybe not so stylish because, you know, or maybe like too hippie or whatever. So I'm trying to like be like, we're a premium underwear brand. Oh yeah, we're also eco-friendly. Yeah. Are you are yeah. you in real, re, 
retailers or are you going direct? We're in one retailer. <laughs> okay. We're in uh, F Apparel. Ooh, um, nice. So suit store. We were in RNZ as well. Okay. I was talking to a few people in Vancouver, and, and I just sent it out to uh, a lot of the bigger retailers like Nordstrom and um, like Boathouse and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's but that takes a little while. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah I just sent it out like I guess r- literally right before I left Vancouver. So it's two and a half, three weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. So if you're allowed to say like, what are your margins on this? Like, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't mind yeah. saying it because honestly, I I don't make money off you. Need all the money that I put into that I make from it, I put back into it. And again, I look at it more of like an experiment to um, to test out other things for new businesses. So um, I feel like the train, like maybe I could still make it be like a big profitable company, but I, it's a really competitive market and I'm right. not expecting to go make a bunch of money off this business. So that's why I'm treating it more like an experiment. I, I might make like, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars in a month in sales, and I'll put it all back into marketing the next month to be like, let's see if this works, see if this works. So then when I start my next business, I already know it works, right? Yeah. Um, so I mean, underwear might cost me like six bucks, mm-hmm. and then I sell it for twenty five ninety five. Okay. Um, but then nobody ever buys it unless it's a discount. Right. So maybe take thirty or thirty percent off, forty percent off, fifty percent off, depending on it. Mm-hmm. And then shipping costs because you end up having to like I do free shipping above fifty dollars, and shipping right. in Canada is ridiculous. That's one thing I learned from this business. <laughs> I had somebody. I'll give an example. I had somebody three houses down order underwear. Um, from my website. I don't think they knew that it was three houses down because mm-hmm. otherwise I would have just ran it over. But so they ordered on the website and the shipping was $17 and 80 cents to ship it three doors down. Wow. At the same time, I had some influencers in London, England that were buying that bought, uh, sorry, I was sending it for freaks or, in, you know, putting an influencer post, whatever shipping to London, England, $7 and 80 cents. <laughs> at the same time I had somebody in Miami that wanted to you know a collab with me shipping there was nine dollars and twenty cents wow. so giving free shipping in Canada is really tough yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. that's why so like that eats up a lot of your margin too and then marketing obviously that right. eats up a lot of your margin so on so on so on so I mean typically when you're in retail you want to market up by four times what your cost is so that's mm-hmm. uh, originally I was charging 20 or 19.99 and then um there's a couple of people that run like the Toronto Fashion Week and I was talking to them and they're giving me advice and they're like, you need to mark it up. They're like, you should put it to 35. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't want to put it to 35. I'm not trying to be in Saks price range. Yeah. Screw them. Um, <laughs> Eric Calvin, I was like, I was like, I would want to be right below Calvin Klein. So usually Calvin Klein's like 28 to $33. So I was like, mm-hmm. okay, I'll get to put it 25 95. I'm still four, four times my cost mm-hmm. for now. It might be higher now. And then I think about <laughs> it with the, everything that's going on. I haven't made a men's order in, in a little bit, but uh, yeah. And my women's one will probably cost. It's, yeah, it's about five bucks for a women's set as well. So, yeah. so are you producing this locally or? Are no, this so I design it locally, but it's all made in China. Okay. So I mean, if you want bamboo fabric, yeah. um, you pretty much have to go to China. Yeah. And they've been doing it the longest. They have by far the best bamboo fabric. Not even with the comparison. Like I think there's someone in North Carolina. I want to say that was trying it out, but like their qualities doesn't even compare. Uh, or you can go to like Indonesia or something, and again, their quality just won't compare. So I think the brand that makes my underwear, I think there's they actually also make diesels. Um, so they were like a reputable manufacturer as well, uh, but they don't use bamboo for diesel. They because they had like cotton options and stuff too. So um, yeah, no, we make it in China and we design it in Canada. So yeah, doesn't that hurt the whole eco friendly thing <laughs> if you're uh, shipping it from China? That's the one problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's why what I was actually looking at recently was shipping, um, moving it locally. Okay. So let's say I move it locally. I still have to buy my bamboo fabric from China and ship it over anyways. Right. The cost of buying the bamboo fabric uh, is pretty much the same price as actually also getting the underwear made there. Okay. So, but I was like, okay. I was like, but if I could say made in Canada, um, people will pay more. So I could, you know, if, even if it costs me more. So <laughs> I think I could talk to you about like eight different manufacturers this year in Canada. Mm-hmm. And there's not many. One of them was like, we could take 50 a month. I was like, okay, my last order was 2000 so that's not going to work. <laughs> like, well, if you want, we could outsource it. And uh, I was like, oh, where are you getting it outsourced? Oh, China. Okay, no. <laughs> I was like, the whole point is like, I try to get it made locally. Yeah. So the ones that I did find that could meet my order needs, uh, I would, it was about, I think it was 24 bucks it would cost. So I'd have to charge, okay. you multiply that by four, I'd be charging $100 for a pair of underwear. Yeah. Um, so I talked to another guy who had a manufacturer in Calgary. And he's like, honestly, he's like, uh, nobody that makes 
eco-friendly underwear or any underwear gets manufactured in China and sorry, in Canada, it's just too much money. Like you're not, unless you're like hand making like 50 pairs mm-hmm. yourself with like your cousin. Um, and you're not making like, if you're not, nobody's selling on a big scale is making in Canada. Yeah. So he's like, what I would do, he's like, what I, and what I do for the people I, I make for, is like, I outsource to Portugal because Portugal is like a hundred percent sustainable fabrics and stuff like that. And you, maybe you can use like, they have a lot of different alternatives to bamboo. I don't think they're as soft. He claimed they can make them as soft. I kind of checked them out. They weren't really as soft. And bamboo has other benefits too. Like it's it's more durable and so on and yeah. so on. Mm-hmm. So there there is alternatives I'm exploring because that is a big concern. And especially with just like, I don't know, it's, you know, you kind of want to keep it like I, I want to keep it local, but it's mm-hmm. it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's a tough problem. That's honestly one of the other reasons why I'm not pushing Unity a bit more than I am. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's a it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I can understand. Yeah, so there's a lot of lessons that I mean from just dabbing into different businesses that you probably learned throughout the years. Yeah. What are some like top three lessons you've learned? Oof. Top three. Um, <laughs> we love doing these lists. Yeah. <laughs> or just like any any like when any when list. you're when you're doing ads, for example. Yeah. Do smaller amounts to test first. Mm-hmm. I thought it'd be better to do large amounts to test how your ads work, but you don't need to do that. Um. Number yeah, number one. Because <laughs> because there's ways to conserve uh, to you know preserve your budget a bit better than I did. Like when I first launched Unity, I think I put like I I literally blew like ten thousand in ads, and it was a complete waste of money. Like I screwed up that ten thousand dollars so much. It was it was horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, like if I had that ten thousand dollars now to put like if if I wanted to put ten thousand dollars now to <laughs> into the company, like I'd be able to do it so much better than I did it before. So like you know learning a bit more of that. Uh, there's a lot of other things you can like underestimate, um, like how to network. So not sorry, how to market as well. There's a lot of different uh, places to market. Like I was just like, oh, Facebook and Instagram ads. That's all you really need. Yeah. But then when, so when I started looking into it, there's like, you know, like actually advertising on podcasts is actually a really good way to do it. And then I just found out about publications. Oh, like, mm-hmm. and then it, so Unity was in Forbes, for example. So, yeah. I like <laughs> like if I would have done that, like let's say I would have done. I uh, got it, sent my uh, product to like Forbes and stuff like that off the bat and got a publication like the first two months. Mm-hmm. Now all my advertisements, I could say like as seen in Forbes. Yeah. And out of nowhere, I have way more so, uh, social, um, social... Social proof. So, yeah, social proof. Mm-hmm. So like there's a lot of different things like that I didn't know off the bat. Um, so, I mean, most of that is related to e-commerce though. So it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, networking is still... I, I always say that. It's like just network as much as you can because you'll learn so much so fast. What are what are some of like your goals like in, in terms of future? Because you say you're not working on uni and you got other plans going, but what's like the end goal? When when do you say uh, I've made it? Uh, originally, my goal was two billion. Okay. Oh. Um, by two thousand and thirty three, um, cool. cool. I, I had it specifically written down mm-hmm. like it was like this by this by this by this like a complete manifestation. Yeah. But I don't want to be a billionaire anymore. <laughs> like I specifically don't want to. I want to be just under. Um, a lot of the people richer people I listen to talk to so on so on it's like once you kind of hit that level you get a lot of issues All right. it sounds like the sweet spot is like 100 to 200 million okay where you have enough money to do whatever you want but you're also looking to like low, be low key if you want to but maybe like a couple people on the street might recognize you yeah and that's like you have like a little bit of everything um so yeah but i mean that's my angle monetary wise mm-hmm. uh i more just want to be able to work purely on things that i actually want to work on so I always am kind of working on something that I think might make me money because I need to live and something that I just purely enjoy. And so I'm always like, again, like I mentioned, I had like 30 businesses that I started that most of my friends don't even know I started, but I was like, came up with an idea. I was like, yeah, I'm going to register this business right now. And then I start, you know, doing, it. um, yeah, I would put more of my time into that. And then by the time all that happens, I also want to have like a family and stuff. I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'll use Jack at his example again. Like he's, made a decent amount of money and he has enough freedom from that that he spends a bunch of time with his kids and his wife and i mean that would be a nice future for me like if i can be 40 years old so 30s 30s are going to be my years where i make money yeah. that's what everybody tells me <laughs> <laughs> right, like everybody has 30 now is like yeah like 20 was experimenting years 30s were like you actually figure it out and you make money and you have yeah. fun and then you know you settle down in your 30s mm-hmm. so yeah goal will be by 30 or sorry by 40 you know to be married get have kids and have enough money that I can like still work on passion projects and invest for the fun of it, but not have to. Right. And then also, yeah. 
So any any advice you can give to that young entrepreneur out there who's wanting to start a business or even don't be afraid to try yeah. and don't be afraid to ask mm. because people are willing to help. Like people are way more friendly than you give credit. Like people are always like, I lost hope in humanity. It's like, eh, if you start talking to more people, you might gain hope in humanity because yeah. the majority of people are actually pretty good people. Um, and especially a lot of people that are successful, you almost give them like a, you stroke their ego almost. If you ask them for advice, they kind of like giving it or maybe they just like giving it because they want to give back and they wish, you know, they could have given it to themselves. So like, don't be afraid to ask. Like every, yeah. most people are willing. like, I have so, way less than I used to, but I have a lot of people that message me in my DMs, like young guys, a lot of them just straight up asked me to give them money, but <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, bro, I really need 500 bucks. I'm like, I saw you at the club last week and you spent like a hundred bucks at the club. Like, like I'm not going to yeah. money. Um, but then a lot of them are just like straight up just ask for advice. And like, yeah. I'm, I'll literally like, I think a lot of them are surprised. Like, Oh, I didn't expect you to like respond or I didn't expect you to give that much of a response. I'll give like paragraphs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of other people the same way, like when I first started as a promoter, for example, uh, before I even met Steven, um, I was like, okay, I was like, who should I talk to that will help me promote? And then I ended up meeting with um, a guy named Sunil. I ended up meeting with Shiraz. I ended up meeting with like a, a couple other people that were bigger promoters in the past and they gave their advice. Yeah. Uh, and same thing, like I was in Vegas uh, for the nightclub and bar convention. This like 2014. Um, and the VIP coordinator for Hackasan ended up sitting down with him and talking to him. I got his phone number. like, anytime you have any questions about promoting, like text me. So I had like that as a resource. Mm-hmm. Um like, don't be afraid to ask because usually, usually the people that are like successful in the industry aren't afraid to share. Mm-hmm. And if they are afraid to share, they're probably not as successful as you think they are mm-hmm. because they're hiding the fact that they don't actually know have anything to share. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> That's smart, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about your necklace there? Yeah, my brother bought it for me in 2020 um, for my birthday. It's Citroen. It uh, brings you wealth. Mm. Uh, back then in 2020, I was working on some absolutely massive business deals um i, I guess should i get more detail yeah, yeah, yeah of course you can't so, say massive um, business deal <laughs> it's it's a painful story because it was uh yeah but i'll tell it anyways okay so uh 2020 covid hits um and then so people are looking for masks and so people are like can you get me masks so somebody had asked me that and i was like i don't know probably I was like so i messaged my manufacturer in china yeah. that makes my underwear I was like, do you guys make masks as well? Like, oh yeah, like how much do you need? And I was like, oh, this person just needs like 5,000. Like, oh, we have a minimum order of a million. Oh, shit, okay. <laughs> They're like, but if you want to order this mask, we can do minimum of 10,000. So I ended up like calling uh, Steven. And I was like, I was like, I was like, oh, what do you think of this? He's like, I don't know, probably worth a shot. Okay, cool. He's like, he's like, he's like, I'm sure we could like sell them to like dental clinics and stuff. Yeah. So I ended up by there's, there's so many hurdles. It turns out it's like you need a medical device equipment license, so you need a license to be able to sell it, depending what level of mask you're selling, and so on, so on, so on. Um, so I ended up buying these masks where you don't need the license as a commercial grade. Okay, so I could sell it to retailers. So I ended up selling like three thousand Under Armour, for example, and then they were like, "Can we you supply like all of our retail stores across Canada?" Kind of thing. And then I didn't I ended up falling through because I ended up getting for cheaper because the moment COVID hit, China marked up their masks by like ten thousand yeah. percent. Yeah, and yeah. it slowly dropped and slowly dropped slowly dropped. Anyways, so people found out I was selling masks. Somebody contacted me like, yo, I heard you're selling masks. Could you get, uh, I think it was like 6 million N- N95s. I was like, I don't know if I can. So I asked my manufacturer. They're like, oh, no, like we don't make those N95s. So I called Steven again. I'm like, okay, I'm like, I need 6 million N95s. Like, who do you know? He's like, oh, I have my guy, like this guy, like he, he can get probably get them. Let me hook up a phone call. Got on a phone call. This guy's like, yeah, I can get you any quantity you want. Like, I'm dealing in the hundreds of millions right now selling these masks. Uh, so the guy's up, I was like, yeah, I can get you six million. Put you on a phone call. Like, okay, if you get you six million, we also need 56 million for the government of the Philippines. A uh, week goes by, like, oh, we need 230 million for a healthcare company out of California. Wow. And keep in mind, so the masks are selling for like a dollar a piece. So, and you're getting like a 10 cent commission. So the commission would have been like $20 million, for example, for the California deal. Um, which is why I was awake so much in 2020 because yeah. a lot of my clients would have been like a hospital group that's based out of uh, Singapore, for example. So, and then they're dealing with a medical, like a hospital company or something like that's out of, you know, Dubai. Mm-hmm. And then you have somebody else in Australia and somebody else in California. And then we're trying to coordinate a phone call. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens three in the morning. So that's time for the phone call. So uh, I was working on these big deals and, uh, my brother ended up getting this necklace. He's like, I feel like you're going to end up being really rich one day. He's like, whether this works out or not, 
he said, hopefully this helps you, uh, you know, make money. He's like, it might not work out from this, but I'm sure it'll work out with something in the future. So wow. uh, just to end the story, and it turned out like 90% of these deals were scams. Wow. Um, there were a lot of successful people in it though. Like I was one guy that one my business, I had a business partner and it was weird how fast this business moved, but like I had a business partner in Houston, a business partner in LA, sorry, two business partners in LA. So it was a group of four of us that were working together to, you know, um, and one of them already had a healthcare equipment company for like the past three years. So that, that was my guy in LA. So he was working with somebody that was featured in Forbes. He had closed like 44 deals and made $650 million so far in the business like that year, 2020. Mm-hmm. He's like, okay, he said, it, the guy said that if we close this deal with him, commission's like 6 million and we can work on every future deal with him if we prove ourselves here. Oh. And then it, the buyer we brought forward turned out that guy was a scam. <laughs> um, like, yeah, I think he ended up going to jail because um, he falsified documents. And it was a massive deal that was horrible. <laughs> and this is what kicked me out of the business. Um, there was a huge company in Singapore I was working with. And they had, essentially, they were going to supply for like 30,000 hospitals worldwide or something like that. So they needed like a billion masks um, because they wanted to supply them for like a couple of years or whatever. Yeah. So I find, I connect with one of the guys I was connected with. He finds a guy in New York who's a real estate developer and, you know, he a lot of these guys would end up uh, investing in this space because it was like a quick business and he made money pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we connected with his lawyer. His lawyer is out of New York, a big lawyer. Um, and he's like, yes, we have these and these storage, these, these containers, blah, 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 blah. And so he had, we ended up connecting him with the, this, the buyer from Singapore. Um, and they're like, hey, you need to prove your funds. And they sent, the, the, I can't say this because I have an NCDA, but they sent their their proof of funds and this is the most money I've ever seen. I didn't know there was that much money in one bank account, but they proved it and Chase, JP Morgan Chase verified it. Uh, they send the money so that they, whatever they go back and forth and they gave some sort of proof. The lawyer like attested, uh, we have this product. They're like, okay, so we'll send our money from our bank in Switzerland to New York. So as they're about to send like billions of dollars to this, uh, New York, JP Morgan Chase like flags the lawyer like the person you're sending uh, the money to, like who's on the recipient of this deal, the seller of this deal, he's on our blacklist for fraud. So they, I think, I don't know what their fee would have been, but I'm assuming it's in the millions for the fee. To, <laughs> like if it's 0.1%, it would be the millions to send the money to the state. So anyways, these guys like obviously stopped working with me because the seller was a fraud and then the guy, they end up like, I think like FBI was investigating that guy and stuff already. So um, yeah, that's how that business ended. But I, I remember that deal was pretty much closed because once the money's like already getting sent, you're like, oh, it's done. All I got to do the next day, they're supposed to go to the warehouse to verify because uh, obviously there wasn't a billion already made or whatever, but it was like, I don't know, a hundred million made, let's say. And then there's a, the rest of it was like a contract, like we're going to make this much per year, whatever. So they were supposed to go verify in the morning. I went out and celebrated the night before. Like I spent like five grand. <laughs> <laughs> like, wake up the next day to a phone call. Like, ah, oh, Jimmy Williams, uh, oh. Jimmy, he's, uh, he scammed us. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, uh, yeah, Less, sometimes things are too good to be true. But the th- nice part is I knew that the money was real, the buyer yeah. was real, they actually wanted the product, just the seller was fake. So it was always happened where, like, I probably worked on over 500 deals. I was That's why I was up so much. And I, I learned a lot. I met a lot of people. I learned how to talk to like super like, like I was one guy that I was working with who was like the CFO for like Trump's campaign, for example, oh. that there was one guy, like there was a bunch of like high up people. I ended up like, I don't know how I ended up like going up these chains, but like I'd be like FaceTiming with like government officials in the States and stuff. And like other governments in Dubai and stuff. What blah, blah, blah. I was like a Dubai prince. So I was talking to <laughs> wow. So yeah, it was like, and I was like, so I met a lot of interesting people. I learned how to talk to like, uh, you know, like high caliber people. Yeah. Um, but like, 90% of the deals were scammed. It was either the buyer was scamming or the seller was scamming. And then it comes to the part where like, oh, you have to prove you have the product. Oh, you have to prove you have the funds. Oh, and then one of them turns out to not have one of them. Yeah. Um, very, uh, yeah. It's interesting lessons. That's <laughs> yeah. All right. But that's why I have the necklace. Yeah. <laughs> the long story short. <laughs> or <laughs> long say, story right? long, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I think on that note, this is a perfect way to end off the podcast. If you haven't already, <laughs> check out Nick. We'll tag everything in the description below. We're on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that stuff. Um, Subscribe if you haven't already. And we're live every Tuesday morning at 11.30 a.m. on the UMFM radio station, 101.5 FM. Until next time, peace. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you so much. Let's go.